My name is Abby Barnes. I've grown up exploring the country's most stunning landscapes, be it through day hikes or multi-day long distance walking. And now I know one thing for sure, I'm pretty addicted to backpacking. I've decided to walk each of the UK's designated national trail paths to explore exactly what makes each route unique. They amass to over two and a half thousand miles, traversing exposed moorlands and rugged mountaintops, pass through bustling market towns and historical cities. They follow world-renowned archaeological discoveries and enter some of the most tranquil valleys and mystical forests this island has to offer. It's not surprising then that they attract walkers from all over the world, many seeking a challenge, others simply wanted to break free from the monotony of everyday life. My reason for hiking the trail is one of discovery and awareness. Getting outside and spending time in nature is now more important than ever before, with obesity rates maintaining record highs and mental health issues affecting over one in four individuals. There are incredible landscapes all around us, but so few of us dare venture out into such seemingly inhospitable lands. Well, I'm here to show you otherwise, and inspire you to don your walking boots and spend more time in the wild. I face my own trials with mental health, but alongside building a strong support network, getting outside and taking the time to reconnect with nature has helped me move further along the road of personal discovery. So, here's me inviting you to join me on my adventure through this beautiful country. There will be challenges along the way, and we're not guaranteed to succeed, but it takes a courageous heart and a brave soul to commit to the unknown. Now all you have to do is decide that you want it more than you are afraid of it. Are you ready? Let's go. I'd love to say I am on Winchester Station, but I would be lying to you. I'm sure you can see behind me. The next two trains are cancelled. I need to get on those trains to go to Basingstoke where I can change to get to Winchester, which is where the South Downs Way begins. But for no apparent reason, they have been cancelled. However, I've spoken to Southwest Trains who run this part of the journey and um, they're gonna put on a taxi. So I'm just waiting to hear now from the taxi who's then gonna take me all the way up to Winchester. The time is 6.50, the train was due at 6.43, so Time is slowly ticking by. The only thing I'm concerned about really is the start time or the time that I begin walking because um, the train would have gone in at Winchester about quarter to nine, which is kind of roughly the sort of time that I'd like to start walking. I have about 18, 19 miles to cover today, but uh, we'll see what time the taxi turns up here and then we'll see what time I get to Winchester. But so long as I get there, <laughs> then um, I can cover that 18 miles as slow or as fast as I can really. I'm in Winchester, so the taxi drive took about two hours and I'm now leaving the station behind and heading towards the rough location of the cathedral itself, which is where the South Downs Way officially begins. I found a map. Okay, there's the cathedral. There's the station I'm here. So if I continue walking down this road, all the way past the pentacle, exciting, and then I should be able to take Market Street across to the cathedral itself. So this here is the Great Hall, and I've just come from that direction, which is the station. The Great Hall is one of the finest surviving old halls from the 13th century, and contains the greatest symbol of medieval oh. mythology. King Arthur's Round Table, which is now all that remains from Winchester Castle. Winchester itself is a bustling city steeped in history. It developed from the Roman town of Antra Belgarum and is now a popular place to visit, boasting science and history museums, a working mill, statues, monuments, and of course, the Great Cathedral. Winchester Cathedral was founded in 642, slightly north of the current location, and is one of the largest cathedrals in Europe. The Norman design we see today was built using limestone from the Isle of Wight. Both inside and out, the building is a grand display of ornate and intricate architecture, with 12th century wall paintings, medieval carvings, and contemporary art inspiring awe and wonder. The cathedral is the final resting place for many renowned individuals, including Jane Austen, who died in Winchester on the 18th of July, 1817. So 
so I'm just walking down past the side of the cathedral. Um, I ended up having to ask in the store where the beginning of the trail is because my guidebook says it's outside the start of the cathedral but there's no signs and uh, they said oh well we were debating the other day where the official start is so I've ended up wandering around for a bit through this very beautiful city um, still unable to find the official start killing time it's 10 o'clock I have 19 miles to cover today so I'm getting a little concerned about the time but uh, just wandering around trying to make sense of my location and pick up the route somewhere here we go this looks about right um, because I'm not sure there is an official start which really confuses me wandering around the city was a slightly daunting experience as I spent a good deal of time feeling disorientated Nevertheless, it seemed every corner I turned would reveal another beautiful building or monumental marvel. Even the college was an old Tudor building. Go straight to the crossroads and then pick up a sign on a fork in the road. Those are my instructions. Finally, the first sign squeezed onto the lamppost. The South Downs Way with a wee little acorn next to it. That's the way I'm going. Okay, 18 miles. Here we go. Just found this sign, Eastbourne, 99 miles away. That's where I'm headed to, the official end of the South Downs Way. Here we go, the M3. And into the wilderness we go now. Burrito. This is where it begins for me when you start to say goodbye to civilization and head into the back and beyond of the South Downs. Here we come. Okay, I've literally just come off of the motorway bridge and I've hit this sign and it's really interesting because it shows here um, yellow being a footpath and the white being a bride away. So on a bride away, you can take bikes and horses, whereas on a footpath, it's literally just walkers and runners. Um, so there's alternate routes along the trail. You can cycle the entire route, and actually, kind of wish I was doing that, but uh, it's nice to slow things down, take things in, listen to the birds, look at the flowers, breathe, and explore the countryside. So on the walkers route, here we go. Oh, I better be able to fit through this. Please, 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 please. Oh, that is tight. Oh, I survived. Okay, let's hope there's no more tight gates like that. Oh, an instant opening out into a field. Lovely. That's nice. Walking away from the city was a seriously satisfying feeling and my mind was finally able to relax. Until I hit the first hill, of course. Almost at the top of the hill. Knew took a wrong turn, but that doesn't matter. Red flag. If I wanted to go that way, I wouldn't be able to. It means that the firing range is in use by the MOD. But fortunately, I'm going this way. Along this track. So I finally come to a stop on this hill. Thank goodness. And I've met Sally. We pass each other a couple of times. She's a uh, Cycling the route. Where are you headed to today, Sally? Um, I'm probably going to get to Midhurst today, but um, I'm going to Eastbourne eventually. So I don't know how long it's going to take me, two or three days. Um, but I'm starting today age 59, and by the time I finish in Eastbourne, I'll be 60. So oh, that's cute. Which day is your birthday? Uh, on Saturday. Oh, well, happy birthday for Thank Saturday. You. So Thank have you me. done much of the South Downs Way before? Um, I've done the Seven Sisters walking. Um, I was walking before I started cycling. When I found cycling, which is a little bit easier, but maybe <laughs> not on the down. A bit faster, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, but you've passed me. Yeah, well, you'll, you'll be you're whizzing walking. past me going downhill, I have no yeah, doubt. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'll be like, yeah. can I hitch a lift, please? <laughs> <laughs> Just crossing the A272 and uh, straight away back on the trail.
Okay, now I'm excited. So I just walked past the lady, we had a quick chat, she didn't want to be on camera, but uh, she said she's just walked past two other people who were backpacking the South Downs Way. Yay, backpackers! Um, I love meeting other walkers, I love finding out about why they're on the trail, how long they're doing it in, you know, are they camping, are they being being? But the key thing is, they're stopping kind of near where I'm stopping this evening. And yes, I'm going to rock up late, <laughs> but uh, hopefully we'll bump into each other over the next couple of days. So, yay, exciting times. I was really enjoying settling into my own pace and taking in the ever-changing sights and sounds. Between breaks in the hedgerows, I was able to look across the stunning Lichen Valley, a 440-acre country park that's accessible to the public. Rapeseed oil, adding a flashing yellow to the landscape and an almost bitter fragrance to the air but it's not a bad smell it's just quite pungent almost well if this isn't making a statement i don't know what is oh, i never go sleeveless it is very hot <laughs> Very, very, very hot. I'm not sure this trend is due to continue for much longer, but uh, I kind of thought, well, if it is going to get cooler, I'd rather sweat less into my clothes or sweat into less clothes so I don't get cold over the next few days because my clothes are damp. So this is out of necessity, not style. <laughs> it's hot. So I should be about to hit the A272 again, um, which gives you the option to go to Sherton or Sheraton, depending on how you pronounce it, which is about half an hour away. Some people might choose to stay there. I am continuing on. For those who do head into Sheraton, look out for Lamborough Lane, which was said to have run red with the blood of the 2,000 men slain during the Battle of Sheraton in 1644. After travelling through Holden Farm and making friends with some horses, I passed the Milbury's pub and then headed back into remote arable farmland. The stillness of the landscape provided me with the space to think about why I walk and how it helps motivate me to keep moving forwards in every area of my life. It's a place to escape, unwind and let my mind get creative. This sense of freedom is one I hope to encourage everyone to seek. Just uh, come across a drinking water point. So that's really good news. If I'd known this was here, if my map had said, I would have stopped here. But uh, it's time to drink a whole bottle and then refill it. <laughs> Perfect. Hit Beacon Hill now. That's us. We're gonna follow along up to the actual peak, the trig point at 201 meters, and then uh, continue on down towards Exton. But basically, this billboard here is just explaining that we're on short grassland, um, and so it's got kind of endemic species or kind of niche species for the, end, for the um, short grassland. So you've got uh, yellow rattle, rest harrow, uh, eye brights, orchids, that's cool, I know what an orchid is. <laughs> and then uh, those flowers attract different numbers of butterflies. So Chalk Hill Blue, I'd love to see one of those. Grizzled Skipper, oh fantastic name. Silver Spotted Skipper Butterflies. That's not quite what I was expecting. I've made it to the top of Beacon Hill, and it's quite windy as you can tell. But I kind of thought there would be a big old climb to the top, and actually, I've just, I suppose I've been climbing pretty much all morning. Um, but anyway, here I am on the top of Beacon Hill, 201 meters above sea level. So just to tell you a little bit about the area that I do know, I know that Beacon Hill is quite notorious in warning about the Spanish Armada in the 16th century. And I think the last time it was lit was June 2012 for the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. 
but um, you can tell quite obviously from the lay of the land that we are on a high point other than over there we're pretty much on the highest point and you can see for miles <laughs> it's quite incredible actually 1.3 miles to Exton look at that view though Whew. I uh, found the beacon in the middle of a muddy cow field. It says Exton Beacon in commemoration of Queen Elizabeth II's Diamond Jubilee, 27th of May 2012. On the outskirts of Exton now. So we're probably just going to wander on through this village, cross over the main A road that runs through the centre of the village, and then uh, the next target will be Old Winchester Hill Fort, so the Iron Age Hill Fort up on the hill. Exton is one of the smallest villages in the Mion Valley, but no less picturesque. It's thought to date back to at least 940 AD, when it was first mentioned in official documents. Right, well, uh, Exton turned out to be tiny. Uh, what was nice though was there was a couple walking through, so I had a chat with them. They were just doing a local walk 11 miles, but they were really enthusiastic about the trail. And uh, yeah, they, they live locally, so they enjoy walking along it. But now I'm leaving Exton behind, heading on towards Old Winchester Hill, which I'm probably going to stop at for a bit actually, just uh, give my shoulder a bit of a rest. But um, I'm walking alongside this river. Most of the world's chalk rivers and streams are actually found in England and are renowned for their iconic wildlife species such as the otter, kingfisher and the salmon. Increasingly though, they've come under threat from population growth, which leads to increased water usage and pollution. And research now shows that one third of water we take from rivers ends up wasted. I literally have no idea where I'm going. This path just keeps getting narrower and narrower. I feel like I should be smuggling something. As I rounded a corner on my way to Old Winchester Hill, I bumped into two other backpackers also walking the trail. We walked all the way to East Meon together, sharing stories and enjoying each other's company. It was great fun. <laughs> The climb up to the top was pretty steep, but it was worth the effort as we sighted some of the hill forts earthworks. Fantastic sign. Which one are you? <laughs> Take care, I'm going on this path. Old Winchester Hill has been a popular beauty spot since the Victorian times and is rich in archaeology from the Mesolithic period right up to World War II. <laughs> You've got that one which is where they're taking you. Yeah. And then you've got this one which is walkers only. Just going past me on Springs campsite. So this is one of the places you can stop overnight. But um, I'm going to head on to the sustainability centre and pretty soon we'll hit the turn in for East Meon, which is where these folks are headed for. But um, the weather's changing slowly. It's becoming a little cooler. But it's pleasant enough and the route's been very similar to this morning really enjoyable. Most of the walking was through farmland and navigation was easy. The real challenge was avoiding being mown down by tractors. Yeah, yeah maybe see you tomorrow. All right, have a good evening guys, see ya. Back on the trail, all by myself. Along the final stretch to the campsite at the Sustainability Centre, I recapped the highs and lows of the day and allowed myself to feel proud at having completed day one. Just arriving at the site now, so I'll get ready to get pitched up and then uh, chill out from there. This is a map of the centre itself, so you can see that it really is a sustainability site. Clues in the name, but they've got wastewater systems, rainwater collection, they've got ponds, meadows, tree nurseries. It looks uh, really like quite a fascinating place actually. 
I'd like to spend a bit more time here. But um, just wandering down to the centre now, underneath this sweet smelling blossom. So I've been wandering around for a bit and I've ended up back here. And I've just noticed these little pegs that have numbers on, which I'm assuming are areas where people can camp. So I'm just gonna pick one and camp. <laughs> Get my tent up and chill out. I went for spot number five since five is my favorite number and I have a, an impressive view of the teachings there. So I'll just pretend I'm on a prairie in South Dakota. <laughs> Tent up, feet aired, and fully refueled, I was so excited to take on the day ahead. And that is the art of camping. Tidying away so it looks like you've never been there. Perfect. Excited for day two. Today we're heading to Cocking, some 18 and a half, 19 miles away. Um, my guidebook says it's 19 and a half from East Meon. But I'm about a mile and a half on from East Meon, so I took a took the morning a little bit leisurely, and actually I spent some time patching up my shoulders, shall we say, because uh, yeah, they're not used to being exposed to the sun and are sufficiently burnt. That there is the beginning of the Meon Valley. A superbly attractive valley that apparently the route's been debated or it's debated whether the route should go through it but uh, we go along the top which I'm not going to argue with the last of the spring bluebells just uh, the final display of colour before the summer officially begins beautiful Just about to pass or enter into the Queen Elizabeth Country Park and the Buster Hill National Nature Reserve. So this is where the route used to begin in 1972. And uh, the Country Park hosts pretty much one of the largest expanses of unbroken woodland in the southeast of England. So I'll try my best not to get lost. <laughs> Might be lost for a while otherwise. Buster Hill Reserve protects a range of habitats, including rare chalk grassland, and is home to over 30 species of butterfly. It's also the site of the Buster Ancient Farm, a unique experimental archaeological site of Iron Age buildings, crops, and rare farm breeds. Walking through the area, I felt as though I were in medieval England, except for the huge A3, which kind of ruined the atmosphere. Walking through this country park, I've kind of come to appreciate just how valuable these spaces are. You know, they're designed and managed in ways that are suitable for a whole host of different users. So you've got walkers, runners, cyclists, mountain bikers, horse riders, dog walkers, family groups, pretty much everything and everybody can come and enjoy this space in some way. And uh, I just think that's really, really special and the value of that can never be underestimated. And the fact that it's also managed in a way that's kind of in harmony with the natural world or that protects the natural world, helps to conserve it, I think is just priceless, absolutely priceless. These green spaces are just one of the most treasured things in the UK because they allow people to get outside. They allow people to escape, to refresh, to come away revived and motivated and inspired. And uh, I think more of us should be utilizing these spaces, getting outdoors and enjoying them for what they are. Passing some old industrial chalk pits and the pretty village of Buriton, I prepared myself for an upcoming challenge in the Harling Down National Trust estate. So I'm Judy and I'm from Kent and we're walking the South Downs Way because in October we're walking across the Gobi Desert uh, to raise money for water aid. So this is a practice run to get ourselves fit and get our walking boots worn in and just make sure that we're okay with uh, doing walking day in, day out. So yeah, it's a practice run for a, a big trek in the desert. 
and I'm Steve, uh, married to Judy, he also lives, so obviously live in Kent as well. We, we had the opportunity to take redundancy from work at the end of last year, so we are effectively retired now. Um, and it's a great time to spend your time outdoors um, rather, than, uh, rather than indoors uh, uh, kicking your heels. So. Hartling Down is a 550 acre chalk common that forms part of the Sussex Downs AUNB, an area of outstanding national beauty. It's a popular place for picnickers and dog walkers. Gotta do some energy now, I suppose, for this climb. <laughs> the climb up to the top of Beacon Hill was short and sharp, but absolutely worth the effort. On the top of Beacon Hill. Wow. What a stunning spot. Archaeological evidence has suggested the site was home to an Iron Age hill fort built around 500 BC. It also hosted a station in the Shutter Telegraph chain from 1796 to 1816, which connected various naval stations. Right then. So we're leaving Beacon Hill behind, and this is it now. Probably the last six miles or so to cocking, and then we're finished for the day. The time is half past one, so we are making very good time. I'm not gonna lie, I've stopped a lot today. Um, I just haven't really been feeling it. But you know, that view has just blown me away, and I'm suddenly feeling, or feeling, I've been reminded about, this is why I love backpacking the freedom, it's being able to explore places you can only get to on foot and it's the inspiration that the natural world provides and uh, I just feel so privileged to be able to be doing what I'm doing and experience this place and uh, now I'm stoked to get to cocking so let's go. <laughs> Look at the landscape I get to walk into. Whew. just bumped into this memorial which is of um, or for a chap called Joseph who was a German airman who was killed on the 13th of August 1940. It's just tucked away in this little corner of the trees. Just taking a slight detour off the route a uh, sign pointed me in the direction of some burial mounds. Here we go. 3,000 years old. Best example of a Bronze Age burial cemetery in the South Downs. The final stretch that day took me over Cocking Down, where I met and chatted to various groups of people. In truth, we were all intrigued by the sound of peacocks coming from the nearby Moncton estate. Okay. We oh, walked wow. up Cotopaxi oh, in Ecuador. Yeah. And that was just magnificent. The route into Cocking took me away from the trail and along a busy A road, although Cocking itself was a more peaceful place. I camped in the back garden of a B&B &B, near a memorial pillar that highlighted the village's history. You're gorgeous, aren't you, huh? Morning. I've just uh, had some porridge for breakfast and in the process of cooking, I kind of noticed slugs everywhere. <laughs> I've removed most of them, but there's loads on here. And then there's one on my flip-flop. There's one on this packet of empty couscous. <laughs> and there was loads more on the roof, but I've kind of taken them all out. Right then, 19 miles to Washington today. No idea what to expect. I have no idea what's coming up. First challenge to navigate this A road and get back up to the official trail. My number one goal, not to get squished. Just going past Hilltop Cottages. I knew there was a water tap here, but there's a cool sign telling me when the next water tap is. So the next one's 11 miles away in Amberley. And apparently I passed one four miles back Burriton farm but uh, I deliberately didn't fill this one up because I knew that there would be a tap here so 
save myself carrying it up the hill. Oh now I'll fill it up now. Never underestimate the importance of stopping and turning around to look at the view behind you. Whew. So I've been climbing for quite a while and uh, the wooded view there, just literally I feel like I could be in, I don't know, prehistory, apart from the uh, coniferous stuff over there. <laughs> it's pretty impressive. The route passed through a gnarly field full of lumps and bumps which, to my surprise, revealed itself to be the site of a Bronze Age burial ground. Pretty much every five minutes I'm getting passed by mountain bikers or runners and there's a lot of walkers out. So you can tell the trail really does get used a lot, especially like for day activities. So that's quite cool and it's nice to see even when the weather isn't as grand as it could be, there's still a whole host of people using it. So it's been nice to bump into quite a few people today. The walk over Bignor Hill actually followed an old Roman road. In Bignor itself is a Roman villa full of intricate mosaics believed to date back to the third century AD. And it's one of the biggest villas in England. Conjuring the hillside revealed sensational views across the tranquil Arran Valley. The area is famous for the River Arran that runs past Hutton Bridge and Amberley Village, where there's a station, working museum, castle and plenty of shops. I'm well and truly now down in the Arran Valley and I have to say this stretch has been my favourite of the whole route so far. It's just so picturesque. So I'm approaching the river now and I have no doubt I'll stop on the banks for a little bit and just enjoy that. And then once I reach Hutton Bridge, I'll have about eight miles left to go. Crossing over the railway line, I climbed up to the top of Rackham Hill, saying hi to some cows who were scoffing an early dinner. It looks yummy. <laughs> Absolutely stunning views down over the valley. Whew. That's worth the climb. Wow, you see the river meandering its way across the floodplain there. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. At the top, I became exposed to a bitter wind and sleety precipitation, but my spirits remained high. From here, it was straight walking for a few miles before I dropped down off the ridge and into Washington. There it is. The A24. On my way to the campsite, I popped into the St Mary's Church to check out the colourful stained glass windows. Alright, well it's quite a way out of the village, but I'm just arriving to the site now. A nice view of most bike place behind me. Here we go. This spot looks like it's got my name on it. Nice view over the entire site. Right then, back on the road again. It's day four today. An interesting day. I have 20 odd miles to cover. And I say 20 odd because the route is 20, but then you have about a mile each side in addition to get to where I'm staying. So I've got about a mile to get back to the trail now uh, from here, Washington, where I'm staying, and then another mile on the other side. But that doesn't matter. Back on the official trail now and starting to climb up to the top of this hill fort. So I've got a bit of a climb now, but I'm hoping since the weather is grand, we're going to get some incredible views. Let's get to the top, shall we? The first climb of the day was up to Shanktonbury Hill to an old hill fort. Little remains today, and the area is perhaps more famous for its folklore and tales of witchcraft, fairies, and other mysterious goings on. 
Given the stories I heard, only the brave would dare stay here overnight. <laughs> In loving memory of a Sussex farmer, Walter Langmead, 1905 to 1989. His ashes laid to rest by his dear wife Molly and sons on his ch cherished downs. Oh. Oh, Molly Langmead, 1909 to 1996. Loving wife and of Walter Langmead, a gentle and devoted mother, remembered with great love, her ashes laid to rest by her sons. Wow, and what a vocation. I just looked up and I uh, thought, oh, the land disappears, what's going on? Then I was like, oh, it's the sea. Finally, the weather is clear enough to see the sea. That's fab. Come across a pig farm. That's so cute. The pig farm was hands down a personal highlight on the walk. I spent a full hour ahhing at their wiggly noses and curly tails. I'm so surprised they didn't come away with one. <laughs> I've been walking alongside this pig farm for a good half an hour now and it still goes on in the distance. There's a lot of pigs and they're so cute. <laughs> it's not the most technical description but they really are. Like basically it's piglets on this side and adults on this side and they're just like oh adorable. Officially over halfway. Eastbourne is 40 miles away. So we've done 60 miles. <laughs> Having dropped down off the ridge, I travelled along the banks of the sleepy river Adder through the Adder Valley. Crossing the river and then the noisy A283, I then found myself climbing back up the other side of the valley. It was a long, steep climb and I ended up in a group of bikers also making their way along the South Downs Trail, albeit a little faster. The sun was out in full force and I struggled to stay cool in blazing heat. Thankfully, I stumbled upon a water tap at the Truly Hill Youth Foster Association just in time. I don't do well in the heat and somehow I managed to resist the temptation to crash in their tea rooms. Whoa, I can see for miles and miles and miles. You can see the path stretching off rather dauntingly ahead of me. Oh, ahead of me, and then you can see the coast to my right, or to the south, to be technical. Gosh, sunny. Wow. I'm currently making my way along the Falking Escarpment and I have to say this is exactly what I imagine the South Downs to be like it's these iconic rolling chalk hills and the area itself right now is owned by the National Trust it's mainly pastoral land so it's just green with this streak of white it's like somebody's got a paintbrush and just drawn it up the hillside and that's the footpath that we're following now or the bridal way even I think this must be the touristy bit. There's like hordes of people walking along. Not that that's a bad thing, it's just a lot of people. It was busy here because I was nearing the famed Devil's Dyke pub and the turn off to the village of Falking. Currently working my way through the Devil's Dyke estate, very much left the people behind. But uh, Devil's Dyke is this huge dry valley to my left here. The ground just kind of drops away said to have been formed by the devil when he uh, dug a hole to encourage the sea inland to flood all of the churches. So there you go. Fortunately I believe the churches have survived. <laughs> anyway, so luckily I haven't had to go down or anything. I'm staying up nice and high. The route's just kind of undulating. There's a few steep climbs up and down, but it's very, very pleasant. At Saddles Cove Farm, a National Trust property about an hour's walk from Poinings Village, is a tea shop called The Hiker's Rest. 
I fully utilised the site and stopped to refuel with a cup of tea and a hummus panini. It was seriously good food. All right then, it's one of the last big climbs for today. Oh, so full. Can't even walk anymore. Is there a rope? Someone carry me. Oh. <laughs> the views behind me just get more and more impressive as I climb. I think at this point when I reach the top is about 248 meters above sea level. So actually, I think this is the highest point on the entire route. As I pressed on towards Paikum and the busy A23, I could see the famous Jack and Jill windmill sitting proudly above the village of Clayton. That is quite a busy road. I'm glad I didn't have to try and cross that, because there's a bridge up ahead. To get to the windmills, I first had to cross a busy golf course and avoid being knocked out by flying golf balls. I found it really interesting watching the games underway, having never played golf before. I think I ought to try it. The Jack and Jill mills are traditional corn mills that date to the 19th century. The Jill mill has been fully restored and now produces stone ground whole grain flour and is open to the public who can climb inside and learn about the area's agricultural past. Further along the trail, I was able to see the Falmouth Football Stadium near Brighton and Hove. Built in 2008, the building cost £93 million to construct. So I'm on top of Ditchling Beacon. I've got one more slight gradual incline and then that's it. Five miles of downhill. <laughs> Ditchling Beacon is another national nature reserve on the trail and a popular tourist spot offering far-reaching views in every direction, including over Ashdown Forest, the home of Winnie the Pooh. Final stretch now. There's a bit about a mile left. Oh, there it is. You can see the field of camping. That's cool. A little slow pee, but I can do with that. Nearly there. The A27. So the farm should be somewhere on the right now. I made it. <laughs> that was easy enough to find. The path's literally just outside. So tomorrow I'll cross over the A road, head back up onto the ridge, and uh, go from there. It's my meal. Looks kind of gunky, but it's good. Literally come out of the campsite and I'm right back on the trail, so that was way worth it. It means I don't have like a half a mile hike to the start of the trail for the day. So really pleased with that. Anyway, on we go to Alperston today. First job, cross over this busy A road. Monday morning rush hour. Look how blue that sky is. That is like, that's insane. I've never seen the sky so blue. Well, not in the last week anyway. Wow. Ugh. It was gonna be a hot day today, I feel. The route away from the campsite took me under a railway and on towards Kingston near Lewes along the side of a wide grassy valley. The views from here are insane, absolutely stunning, just miles and miles and miles. So the sea should be on my right pretty much all day today. Well, I mean, it's not going to move to my left, but I mean, I should be able to see it all day. <laughs> oh, 
lovely. Walking along the ridge made for seriously speedy progress, and rather unexpectedly, I came across a marker revealing the meridian line, which totally excited my inner geographer. I've just stopped for a little bit. I'm in southeast now, so I think I've covered about nine miles and I've got about eight to go. Um, I'm just stopped in the shade outside of this church here. Southeast is a sleepy little village and a great place to stop and relax. Conveniently, there's a water tap just outside the St Peter's Church. Crossing over the River Ouse. Ouse is a common name for rivers in the UK, as it stems from the Celtic word for water. So we're going all the way up to the top of there. The views behind over the Ouse Valley were like something out of a fictional novel, with the meadow of wildflowers adding further colour to the scenery. It was absolutely beautiful. So I've pretty much done most of the climbing for this day, heading on towards Alfriston. I should be there within the hour, <coughs> hopefully, if we're going to plan. Up on Beddingham Hill, I was able to look south towards Seaford Head and New Haven Harbour. I was shocked at how quickly the miles were passing, so stopped often to enjoy the peaceful landscape. This one big black rain cloud has decided it wants to empty some precipitation down on us. So uh, just as I start to approach Alfriston down there, you can see the church in the distance. It's uh, just beginning to shower, but actually it's quite refreshing and cool and I'm nearly there now anyway. Alfriston is an insanely pretty village, famous for its random mix of wood-beamed Tudor buildings that mostly line the high street. The place is seeped in history. It has three inns, the Star, George and the Smugglers Inn, a shop famous for its traditional products, and countless tea shops boasting every type of cake imaginable. At the heart of the village is the Tie Green and St Andrew's Church. Dating to the 1370s, the church is now a grade one listed building and appropriately nicknamed the Cathedral of the Downs. Well, Alfriston's a really pretty place. Very quaint. Um, I'm now working my way along a side road and I think the campsite should be along here. I'm not 100% sure. I was staying at the Alfriston Camping Park a basic site tucked away behind the village. Okay, so it's just gone five o'clock. Heading back towards the trail now, I need to walk back along this road and then head back into Alfriston. So it'd be cool to see that in a different atmosphere. And then uh, rejoin the trail and make our way up towards the cliffs and the coast and then to on towards Eastbourne. So 12 miles and the 12 miles is pretty much from here to Eastbourne Station, it's actually a 10 mile route, but a few extra miles here and there, so really looking forward to this. It's going to be me and the birds for a bit. Yes. <laughs> that night I had trouble with some caravanners who seemed to think they owned the site and basically parked right on top of my tent, despite having the whole field. Their rowdiness made me feel really unsafe and I left as soon as there was light in the sky. It was so good to be back out on the trail. There we go, South Downs Way, just opposite the main village store. I'm sure you can see behind me, the uh, sun apparently isn't up properly yet, which is quite cool, so I'll be walking with the sunrise behind me. And uh, actually I'm just approaching the bridge now that takes us over the river. literally the other side of the bridge you've got this sign here which tells us that way is the bridal way so that's the inland route and then down here the yellow which is the footpath as you can see there exit is where we're going three miles away then we'll be on the coast so we're going to follow the river for a bit now walking away from the village took me past the clergy house owned by the national trust but my mind wasn't so much focused on history as the beauty of the landscape around me shimmering gold as the sun filled the sky 
It was such an incredible experience and really filled my soul with joy. I think this is the point where we turn away from the river and head into Littlington. Goodbye, River Cuckmere. Littlington was a little village the trail passed through before I headed up into farmland and the last inland stretch of the trail. I have to admit, these gates are getting a bit of a pain. They're just and just big enough to fit through with a rucksack. Okay, that one I fit through. Most of them I've had to push and squeeze and shove. The bird song and clear morning air spurred me on and I was so excited to reach the coast. There you go. One and a half miles to Cuckmere Haven, and that is the coast. So one and a half miles to the sea, up here. <laughs> oh, wow. Gosh, look at that. Oh, that's stunning. I was not expecting that as I rounded the corner. Anyway, I see the sea. I'm nearly there. And I can see the river Cuckmere is at the end. It's all the way open. To the, to the mouth and this is one of the few undeveloped river mouths in the southeast and I get to explore it. 10,000 years ago sands and gravels were deposited during the ice ages and then peat swamps formed around three to six thousand years ago so this area was a salt marsh until 1846. Oh really? Man has halted the natural process by controlling the route of the Cuckmere and stopping the sea and river occasionally flooding the valley. We could easily restore these and recreate salt marsh if we wanted. <laughs> 10 miles to go. So that means I've walked 90 miles so far. So heading towards the Seven Sisters Country Park now. How stunning are these flowers? <laughs> so yellow. That's the way to the beach. This is the way to Eastbourne. So I've been following the river Cuckmere for quite a while now and I'm about to go over the brow of this hill. So this whole Cuckmere Haven Bay is all about to disappear from view. And before it does, I just wanted to say a little bit about the smuggling that went on here. So smuggling was rife, right through the 18th century and right up until the early 19th century, actually. And uh, the Alverston Gang was one of the main groups that operated here. Now Stanton Collins was the head of the group and he actually owned the Ye Olde Smugglers Inn in Alfriston, so we passed that pub um, when we were walking through Alfriston. And he'd use that, or his gang would use that as their base to kind of plan their, their ventures, I suppose you could call them. And one of his most notorious operations was um, to raid a, a Dutch ship that was stranded here in Cuckmere Bay in the 1800s. So they, they took all the goods and uh, took them up the river Cuckmere. And you know, Stanton wasn't actually arrested until 1831 and that was for sheep wrestling, and then he was shipped off to Australia. But uh, just looking down here, especially when it's so quiet this early in the morning, you can really imagine a big ship with its tall mast sticking up. And uh, you can just see how, especially when this area was still a salt marsh before it was changed and controlled by mankind to, to reduce flooding, you know, you can see why this area was perfect for smuggling. There they are, the Southern Sisters on the rolling chalk coast. Few up and down climbs right now. <laughs> oh, is that not incredible? Wow. The Southern Sisters Country Park completely blew me away. The chalk cliffs are the remains of dry valleys that have been eroded over time by the sea, and each peak and dip has been individually named by locals. The area has a rich historical past, with numerous shipwrecks lining the seabed below, including a Spanish ship which ran aground in 1747, resulting in the tragic deaths of 30 crewmen. You can just see Birdling Gap there in the distance. 
it was a little village but it's kind of eroding away into the sea and it's pretty much now all owned by the National Trust so there's a cafe there and like a few B&Bs and that's about it really four and a half miles to go so three more miles of climbing uphill and then a mile and a half of downhill into Eastbourne itself oh I'm so excited but I'm loving this many buildings in Burnley Gap have been lost to the sea as a result of coastal erosion but those that remain are still inhabited there's a cafe shop and a visitor center run by the National Trust meaning the hamlet is a popular stop off for coach tours Heading back up the cliff, the next site of interest was the Belle Tout Lighthouse. Although operational since 1834, it's now decommissioned and used as a and b costing up to £230 per night. Just over the brow, views opened up to reveal the iconic Beachy Head Lighthouse, sitting just offshore below Beachy Head Cliff. One final climb and I was on top of Beachy Head itself and almost instantly inundated by tourists and school groups visiting the area. The cliff is the highest chalk sea cliff in Britain, rising 531 feet above sea level and overlooks the red and white lighthouse below, which is still operational today. Well, I think the crowds of people give it away. I have pretty much made it. So I've nearly walked 100 miles from the Cathedral City of Winchester and I've got a mile and a half to go to Eastbourne. And then that's it, I've done it. I've walked across Sussex and I've made it to the top of Beachy Head. I just, I don't really have the words, you know. I've explored some fantastic little villages just tucked away in valleys, the wonderful riversides, and of course the stunning views that I've experienced from the top of the ridge. And then the Southern Sisters today, I'm just completely blown away by it all. What an incredible, incredible trail. I'd do it again in a heartbeat and you know the weather's made all the difference I've only had the one day that's been a little damp but other than that it's been pretty much like this every single day absolutely glorious I've got the sunburn to prove it but I'm just I'm blown away by it all absolutely speechless so I'm just going to spend a little bit of time enjoying this location becoming a tourist again <laughs> and then uh, we'll head on down into Eastbourne make our way to the train station but I'm really really sad it's over and I've, I've just loved exploring a new part of the country like I've never been to any of these places before and it's been absolutely incredible so really really recommend this route I've just come over the brow of the hill and uh, been greeted by these crazy views of the sprawl that is Eastbourne I've never been to Eastbourne before, but it, uh, well, I mean, I can see the pier and there's a big old high rise building and you can see a church spire, but uh, I need to walk all the way across that city now. The last stretch took me through the Beachy Head Park, past a monument in tribute to those in the RAF who fought in World War II. The location was a fitting place for me to recap my adventure and I struggled to swallow the sense of sadness that was rising within me as I neared the end. I truly believe the most beautiful things in life are not material objects, but people, places and memory. I want to encourage you to undertake whatever journey you're being called to, even if it means going alone. I know it seems scary, but I can guarantee that you'll come away more courageous, fulfilled and closer to the person you were born to be. Winchester, 100 miles. Yes. Officially made it. I'm in Eastbourne now. So Winchester is 100 miles away. Fab. So that's it then. That's officially the end of my journey along the South Downs Way. I'm now making my way towards the seafront and then from there I'll, uh, well, I'll just do my own thing. So I've never been to Eastbourne before, so I'm excited to have a look around and see what it has to offer. The seaside resort is largely formed from Victorian hotels and full of tourists enjoying a sunny day out. 
I made my way through the crowds clutching ice creams, towards the famous pier, and on to the station, taking my time and feeling proud of my accomplishment. If you're looking for adventure, you can't go wrong with the South Downs Way, where every corner and hill reveals a new surprise.